All right. Welcome, everyone. It is Ask and Answer Friday at the Nonprofit Show. I am one of your co-hosts today, Nico Marco Whitlock, and I am joined um, with our co-hosts who will have an opportunity to um, introduce themselves momentarily. And we're going to give folks just a few more moments to um, join us, and then we'll go ahead and get moving here. Um, but we hope you're having a great Friday wherever you are joining from. Um, so, Muhi, you are joining us from, where are you joining us from today? <laughs> yeah, I am joining us from Lima, Peru today. Awesome. So uh, joining us from very far away to make sure that you get all of your questions um, answered. And we have lots of amazing questions um, for you all um, to, to consider today. And as we get moving here, I want to um, remind folks that we do this every Friday at the same time. And so uh, Muhi and, and I are here today, but we also have a panel of co-hosts um, that are joining us and Julia to help make this a wonderful experience for all of us. Lots of expertise, lots of diverse voices um, that we're bringing to this iteration of the nonprofit show. And so we are just delighted to be able to join you here today. Um, we also want to, as we get started here, we want to thank all of our sponsors. We have lots of sponsors that have um, generously um, joined us and, and supporting this show. And so we want to thank them and acknowledge them for what they have done and how they continue to support us. And if it's okay with you, Muhi, I think we are ready to just go ahead and dive in. We have um, quite a few questions that are pretty interesting, wide ranging. Uh, so are you ready to jump in? Are you ready to rock and roll? Always. All right, awesome. Uh, so we have our first question um, up. So this is this question is from Marcus from Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the question reads as follows. It says, we are trying to get a program officer from a large funder to tour our campus. They're hesitant to make a commitment for a tour. We believe that if they could see our programming in action, it would help us forge a strong relationship. Any suggestions? So I have a few thoughts here that I would like to share, but Muhi, I'm curious, coming all the way from Peru, what are you what are you thinking? What do you think when you see this question? Yeah, thank you so much. I think, you know, it's a great strategy for engagement and the foundation, you know, if they have an open cycle, if the if they are already a funder of your program, uh, these are great ways to increase their engagement and commitment and forge a strong relationship, just like you're trying to do. Um, but, you know, we at Fundraising Academy, we have the cost selling cycle. And I want to make sure that, you know, have you done your prospecting? Have you done your free approach work? Uh, the things that you should be figuring out about the donor. Uh, and the foundation and why is it a good fit? If you can position and make that ask in a tangible way um, to showcase, you know, you're funding similar programs, you're doing so much in this space that we are doing, whether it's a education service organization or um, maybe it's a food bank or some sort of different organization and find that alignment. And if the program officer is hesitant, try to see what their objections are. Um, what can you do to uh, make a opportunity? Is a tour the first best approach or is it a phone call? What other ways have you already engaged the foundation? So maybe taking it back to the basics and looking at what are all the methods of communication that you've already tried and why is the tour the next best step? I agree it's a strong approach for deepening the relationship, uh, but want to know more about um, what is the tangible outcome and why is it the best next step? Yeah, that, that, I think that sounds um, pretty solid, pretty solid advice coming from Muhi. Um, and if I could, I would add just a few more things in terms of thinking about creative ways that you could 
maybe get to a comparable experience. And so I assume from the question that we're talking about an in-campus tour. And part of me wonders, um, just like with real estate now, there are lots of different options for for virtual tours. And so I wonder if there's an option to do a live virtual tour, whether it's something really low tech, like uh, a FaceTime call where you're actually doing that over FaceTime or over Zoom um, on a mobile device, for example. Uh, another option is to think about, you know, is this something that you all could film and maybe send a recorded tour of you all walking through the campus, um, maybe giving a bit of a, a preview? Maybe that could be part of this pre-work that that movie that you were alluding to. I'm curious. So how do you what, what do you think about that idea? Yeah, and I think, you know, Marcus not knowing your position within the organization, um, maybe uh, invitation from senior leadership or a board member, or maybe if they are a current large funder to your organization, what was that initial introduction and touch point? Uh, go back to kind of how the genesis of that partnership started and see if there's a way you know, maybe there's somebody else in the organization that has a stronger connection uh, and with somebody else on the foundation's team. Um, so just try to uh, think through who has the strongest uh, connection to the funder as well. Sounds pretty solid to me. Anything else before we move on to the next question? No. Nope. All right, Marcus. So there you have it. You have our two cents and more and Hopefully that some of that is helpful for you. All right, so let's move us along to this next question that we have here. All right, so next question is from Maya from Dallas, Texas. And this question is, as we look at our snail mail campaign for the next holiday season, we are wondering if we should dump the mail campaign and go all in on digital campaigns only. Can you give us your thoughts on this? It is a stressful decision exclamation point. I feel your stress, Maya. Muhi, thoughts? Yeah, you know, Maya, first half, I was like, yes, they're still <laughs> doing snail mail. Second half, I was like, oh, maybe we should pause. Um, <laughs> I'm a firm believer that snail mail is great, even if it's for marketing purposes, brand recognition, it's another way to get in front of your donors. You may not always have an email address, a social media connection, or a way to get in front of digitally uh, to your donors, but there are very unique digital campaigns. There's uh, products that can get you geolocation, and you know if they visit your website, you'll show up on their social media ad, and like very nuanced and strategic ways that digital campaigns are very effective. Um, what I will say is that it should be a both strategy. Uh, you should be doing digital campaigns. You should be doing snail mail. If you feel like your investment in snail mail isn't high on the return, do a very segmented list. Maybe you don't need to send it to everybody. Send it to those who give through that means. Uh, send it to those who you don't have an email address for, uh, so that you're at least getting in front of them. And hopefully you can even go from snail mail to digital with a QR code or other means that will help you increase your footprint. Um, so it is a stressful decision uh, to see even which digital partners you should engage beyond social media posts, beyond um, Google AdWords that may be free for your nonprofit um, and other means, how else can you put a few hundred bucks a month to a digital strategy uh, if that's within your budget or more? Uh, and investments in marketing will pay off. You want to focus on your donor retention, your acquisition, getting in front of them, uh, prospecting, all of those things are so important. Um, so I think that it is a strategy for 
both means and not just snail mail or digital. Excellent. Sounds like pretty solid advice. And I would add my two cents on this as a former communications person. Uh, I'm always asking the question, who is the audience and what do you want them to do? And I always remind folks when we talk about this, that you don't have to play the guessing game. You can simply ask people. So, you know, you could, you could take the folks that you already are connected with, that you already have access to. If you aren't already checking in with folks to understand what their communications preferences are in this particular case, asking folks what they prefer um, and tailoring to that, then I think this is an opportunity to, to think about how you might want to do this. Um, I think it really just depends on, on your audience. What does your audience want? What are they responsive to? Um, and as an example, I, I recently had a, an alumni relations person reach out from a school that I attended, um, and they wanted my, my physical mailing address. And I share with the person that I am a minimalist, that I don't like to receive physical mail. And so if you have updates, please send them digitally, right? And I think that there are lots of folks that are sort of in that camp that have very strong preferences, maybe for one or the other, or maybe for both. And I think you could maximize your resources, um, to your point, Muhi, by segmenting, figuring out which segment of the folks that you are trying to reach out to have a preference for that or might be the best way to reach them if you don't have another means to reach them digitally. Um, and the, for, the, for folks like me that perhaps would prefer a digital-only approach, um, using that as a way to um, segment not only the audience, but also to to more uh, efficiently use what resources you might have available. Other thoughts before we move on, Mugi? Yeah, I think you made some great points, especially on donor preference and respecting that. I also wanted to share that, you know, if, you know, a lot of things end up in the recycling bin when they come to me, but I still at least like seeing it um, I've been at other organizations, I won't mention, where it's just overkill. It's once a month, it's huge budgets that they have and they're sending. And at the end of the year, the donors may get frustrated. Um, so they want to be taken off. So I get that. But if you're only doing a holiday season once or twice a year, snail mail, I think that's still a good touch point to, to get in front of your donors. Excellent. All right, Maya, there you have it. You have lots to chew on there. And hopefully this can be a less stressful decision. And um, when it comes to things like this, whether it's choosing, a, a, you know, which which method works for you, um, I always think that it doesn't have to be stressful in terms of guessing because you don't have to guess. You can just ask people what they want and and, seg and, and essentially respond based on what people are telling you. So I'm assuming that you have a list to work from that you could maybe do a segment of those folks, maybe an email survey or a snail mail survey or um, some a subset of it, like a, a focus group for folks that are really actively engaged and might be interested in giving you some direct feedback. So Maya, there you go. All right, so let's move forward. Um, and it looks like we have Shania from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. And their question is this. I need some feedback on this. For years, our nonprofit had an employee of the month. It included a plaque and a $100 cash award. It was always done in the break room where the plaque lives. Now that we are work from home and there is not a lot of activity in our break room, should we discontinue this award? I have thoughts about this as well. Muhi, I'm, I'm curious, I see you smiling. Um, for folks that can't see Muhi smile, he has a, a very wonderful smile. So tell us, Muhi, what are you thinking? Thank you. Um, you know, in work from home culture, there still needs to be ways in which you recognize your employees. If this was a plaque where simply the name of the donor added on to that plaque and it's not a unique plaque for that specific employee, sure, I think maybe you can go to create employee specific plaques that are still mailed out. Uh, it's a small recognition. It's something that will boost your employee morale. Uh, and I think that the award should continue 
in addition to other methods of um, increasing employee satisfaction. Uh, um, so Shania, although your organization is now work from home, I think a lot of companies have and organizations have thought through their methods of engagement with their employees and whether it's a uh, stipend for home internet and workplace and all of those things go a long way. But I think uh, employee of the month is still a valuable thing to, to do. Absolutely. And I would just add to that, that I think it's important to recognize that at the end of the day, what we're talking about is how we cultivate those human connections. And that doesn't disappear because we are communicating primarily by screen screens because we are working from home. And so I absolutely agree with you that recognition, whatever that looks like for your organization, um, should continue in some form of figuring out like what, how does that work uh, in a virtual or hybrid environment. Um, one thing that I didn't see in the question um, that I think perhaps is an opportunity for Shania is to actually, if you haven't already, ask your team about this, right? Do, do they actually like this form of recognition? Is there some other form of recognition that they would prefer? Uh, this is another um, area where you don't have to do guesswork. You can simply ask people what they want and you could adjust your your solution based based on that. Um, and you don't have to be the one that comes up with all the ideas. I'm sure people have ideas. So you can not only ask people what they want, but you could ask them for for ideas. And um, you know, you can essentially facilitate that. You don't have to feel like you have to have all the answers. So this is one of the beauty of actually asking people a question um, in the in this case. So uh, completely agree with you, Muhi, that Shania and the team should figure out how to continue this culture of appreciation and recognition. Um, but you don't have to guess in terms of how that happens. Simply ask people, is this actually working? Would you prefer a different way? If so, what would that different way be? All right. So our next question is from Ramon from Miami, Florida. So Ramon says this, we've been getting some mixed information about if our board can advocate on behalf of our nonprofit. Specifically, we want to visit our state legislatures to advocate for children's mental health. How do we go about determining if we can do this legally without jeopardizing our 501c3 nonprofit status? This is a question that comes up over and over again, I think despite the IRS guidelines being crystal clear about this and have been for quite some time, but Muhi, I'm, Chris, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what thoughts, if any, you might have on this. Yeah, you know, if it's not directly lobbying and you're not spending more than the allotted amount, um, I think that it is good to build relationships and how you engage state legislators is important. Um, you know, there might be some legislative action or a day of recognition or a specific month that you can create more uh, awareness. And I think it is important for maybe even somebody from the state legislator staff to be updated and informed on what your organization is doing. And within the specific community, I'm sure that state legislators want to know what's happening in their districts. Uh, so I think that there are ways to um, be, uh, to exercise caution, but also exercise due diligence and building relationships in a positive way uh, that you're not trying to by state legislators, right? You're just simply informing them about the good work that your organization is doing uh, and how your organization makes an impact in their district, in their community. And those are stories that they want to know about. So I'll leave it at that. Absolutely. And I, I think it, I think it's um, a myth in some parts of the sector, perhaps among folks that are newer about this idea of not being able to work with or communicate with legislatures around, you know, these particular types of issues or your, or your cause. 
you know, having worked for um, an advocacy association where we worked on behalf of uh, public health officials, um, one of the things that that was really helpful for me is using the language educating. So we're not lobbying, we're not we're not advocating, we're educating legislators, we're educating the White House, we're educating members of Congress about our issue. We're educating people about the impact on the community. We're educating them about what policy changes would be helpful to get to optimal outcomes um, related to this particular area or this particular population. And I think for some people that can be helpful just to think about reframing it that way, um, that we're not talking about writing checks to people um, to get them to, to do something. We're, we're educating them about a public good that we're engaged in and how they can hopefully be enrolled in that vision that we have for that. Um, the second thought that I have is for many different segments of the sector, there are groups or associations and coalitions that are actively doing this work. And so um, for Ramon, my one of my suggestions would be to identify who are those coalitions of partners and organizations? Um, what is the association for children's mental health in Miami and Florida, even nationwide, that is already doing this work. And not only can you join forces and make your resources and time go a bit further in terms of advocacy, um, but you're also going to be able to get a bit more clarity from folks that may be a bit more seasoned at having those kinds of relationships with, with legislators at the local, state, and even the, the national level. So that, that would be my recommendation um, for you, Ramon, as a, as a starting point. Yeah. And additionally, I think many representatives in office have staffers that are their eyes and ears on the ground. They want to know, again, how to engage in the community. You may even invite a state legislator or somebody from their office in uh, government affairs or some uh, department to speak at your organization's event. Uh, you may, if they do put anything into legislation to help your organization, consider recognizing that state legislator or representative in your organization's event, give them an award um, or some sort of um, recognition as well. So I think, again, these are all things that any nonprofit can do without jeopardizing their status. Uh, it's just about building relationships and keeping them informed. Uh, do what you would for a donor, just like you would for the state legislator, of building that relationship, of keeping them abreast of the wins that your organization is having, uh, and celebrate those victories with them so that they know what's happening in their communities. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll add one last point before we move forward. I know that... Um having worked at the state level and national level, um, that oftentimes legislators and their staff are actually looking to experts like you, Ramon, who are subject matter experts in a particular area as they are trying to figure out what they should be prioritizing, what policy areas they should be focusing on, what should a particular type of legislation or policy um, looks like. And so part of building that relationship is also recognizing that you have something of value to bring to the table, to the relationship, to um, the conversation. You know, um, the the folks that work in government and legislators are are well-meaning, but they aren't necessarily subject matter experts in all the issues. And so you being a part of this process of educating is the critical part of making the system work. Um, it's not you being a burden or, or doing something that you're not supposed to be doing. It's actually how the system is designed um, to work. All right, so thank you, Ramon, for that question. And let's see what else we have here as we begin to wrap up. Okay, so our next question is anonymous um, from Oakland, California. And the question reads as follows. Our CEO is asking all employees to make a donation to our nonprofit. She feels that it would make our organization look good to report that we have 100% employee participation. I'm hardly making ends meet. This seems like a marketing ploy to me and it makes me angry. Um, my first thought in reading this in preparation for this was 
like what a strange situation, but I'm, you know, I'm not a fundraising expert. So Muhi, what are, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, I think, you know, staff campaigns, board campaigns, um, they are common in the nonprofit community, especially in healthcare organizations um, and just across the nonprofit industry. So to see this um, isn't out of the norm. However, having lived in the San Francisco Bay Area for 10 years, I know how extremely challenging it can be to make ends meet. Uh, and I think that there needs to be conversations around equity. There needs to be conversations around um, living standards and in our industry, making sure that we meet above the poverty line. Uh, you'd be surprised that for a family of four, the poverty line in the San Francisco Bay Area when I was living there several years ago was like $104,000. Right. So if our nonprofits aren't paying beyond that, they're going to be in this situation. Um, and I think that as a fundraiser, I also see the value in the 100% employee participation. Uh, so even if it's a dollar, five dollars, whatever amount that won't break your bank, sure, it may seem gimmicky or marketing wise, but in order to say to a grant making organization that 100% of our board and 100% of our staff give to the organization is a very strong statement. And I think if you work at a nonprofit, you want to have mission alignment, you want to believe in it, you want to support it. Yes, you put your blood and sweat and tears into it. Um, but it, it should also be a place that you want to give to. And I don't know this person's specific situation, but if they're doing no charitable giving, or maybe they only have a budget of a hundred dollars to give to all the charities that they love, and they just do $10 donations to every single one of them, you know, consider doing what you can to help. Um, and I know that it is a place of privilege where I speak from um, because I do believe in trying to make that extra effort in supporting the places that I work as a consultant, as an employee. Um, so yeah, just uh, some thoughts and it may be controversial, but I think that it is well worth giving within your means. Uh, and it shouldn't be an expectation that everybody gives 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or anything like that. Again, it should be within your means. And even if it's a gift of a dollar, it shouldn't be frowned upon. Yes. And so I, I agree with you in part, and I think I, I disagree on this. I, I think the, in practical terms, if you don't have a, if you're not in a position to change the policy, I think thinking about how you could find a way to meet that, that obligation, it sounds like, it sounds like it's required. Um, and you know, doing it within your means. So the idea, of, I like the idea of giving a, a dollar. Um, I think that that sounds pretty solid if if that's something that's going to work with this particular situation. Um, I think more broadly, though, I, I, I would say that for campaigns like this, where it's made mandatory for, for staff and, and employees, um, you are already donating your time and energy. Uh, and so to ask people and require people to make an additional donation on top of that i i don't know I, that doesn't sit well with me um at a board level that's i think that's a bit different i think lots of boards have a a very clear you know um sort of set of requirements when they're bringing on board members i've served on boards where there has been um in some cases it's been sort of a mandatory minimum in terms of an ask either you ask and bring in a certain amount or you write a check for for that amount i've served on boards where it's completely optional um and there's it's, it's suggested but it's not something that is mandatory and going back to your question about equity part of the reason for that and one of the boards i served on was because they wanted to um not just have people that have financial means but they were looking for a wide range of expertise um that wasn't necessarily connected to how much 
in terms of resources or connections someone had. Um, so, but I'm not a fundraising expert, so that's just my opinion. <laughs> All right, so thank you, person from Oakland. So hopefully that gives you something to think about um, and some concrete um, guidance that you could follow as you figure out how to navigate this particular uh, issue with your organization. And um, just a reminder, we want to just acknowledge and thank all of our sponsors that have made uh, this show possible and continue to make it possible. Uh, we could not do this without them. And so we want to just acknowledge them and thank them um, for their, their contributions and the ways in which they support um, this platform. And if you want to stay connected, we want to invite you to hop over to the nonprofitshow.com. Um, you can also go over to American Nonprofit Academy um, com as well to learn more um, about the show and to check out um, today's episode and all the other episodes and future episodes. So I have been with you today, Miko and Marco Whitlock, joined together today with Muhi. We want to thank you all for joining us and wishing you a great rest of your Friday and weekend.